Well, Happy New Year again for those who have just made their way back from the holidays. It's good to see you here. And uh, I can say this, though, I sincerely hope that your new year is uh, starting off a little better than mine. All right. If you were here last week, uh, you got the opportunity to hear my dad preach since I uh, rang in the new year with some sickness. And I actually almost had to call him back this week because on Tuesday, I was driving to work down the 401 and for some reason, the hood on my car, the latch on the hood, sorry, decided to let go. And as I'm driving down the highway, smack, the, the hood of the car hit my windshield and, and smashed it. Fortunately, nothing came back on me. I was able to navigate to get to the side of the road. Um, and, uh, you know, everything was okay. I'm, I'm okay. My car, uh, unfortunately, is not so much. And uh, so for those of you that are out there that actually pray for us as a staff, I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you for praying for us, and if I could get you to continue to pray, that would be great, because uh, next week I'm actually headed out of the country, so, uh, so I, I covered your prayers for that. Um, but it was great having my dad here. You know, it, it's funny, because before I came to Bayview Glen, I was a high school teacher, and I always, I was one of those weird teachers. I actually looked forward to parent-teacher interviews, um, and I looked forward to it for this one reason, and that is because when I saw the parents sit across the table from me, all of a sudden, I understood their kid a whole lot better. I'm like, I get, I know why Jimmy's like that. Yeah, all right. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. How you doing? So, uh, you know, it's funny because in talking with some of you uh, after the last couple Sundays, um, you know, these are some of the comments that, that I was getting. You know, I understand you a little better there, uh, Pastor Dave, you know, now that I've met um, your dad. So, obviously, the effects of my gene pool on me are, are uh, of no mystery. And uh, so, like I said, I've been blessed to have my dad to be able to step into this mini-series mini that I've called Epiphanies as we re reflect on what it means that God came near. It's about how Christ has revealed to himself in the past, and how if we will take the time to slow down, he may be trying to reveal himself to us now. You see, having my dad here, this isn't the first time that my dad's good genes have actually helped me out. Um, the first time that I really noticed that my gene pool was, uh, you know, was good was when uh, my wife met my parents for the first time. And uh, after she met my dad, uh, and uh, she uh, came up to me and she said, you know what, Dave, you've actually met the criteria, one of my criteria for a husband. I was like, wow, wow. I mean, all I, that, that was it. All I had to do was introduce you to my family and, you know, that was a done deal. That, that was, that's pretty easy. And I, I was just curious. I said, so tell me, what, what was the criteria? But she told me that my dad, who was 46 at the time, you know, he had a full head of hair. And uh, so... <laughs> I would most likely have my hair into the twilight of my years. Well, at this point, I was thinking two things. The first thing is, my wife apparently didn't know that the gene for male pattern baldness comes from the mother's side. <laughs> and the second is this, I'm glad she didn't meet my mom's brothers. <laughs> all right, they're both bald, all right? So I, I dodged a bullet on that one. It is no mystery to us that our genes dictate more than just our appearance. They can be analyzed to see if we are prone to certain disease or other physical disorders, but our genes also play a role in shaping our character, personalities, and man mannerisms. You see, the code to unlocking why we are the way we are, and even to some degree who we are, is in our genes. It is for this reason that when a follower of Jesus named Matthew wrote his biography of Jesus known as the Gospel of Matthew, he started with his genealogy. Now, if I was trying to write a biography that I actually wanted people to read, um, I, I don't think I would start with, the, with a list of names of whom most people on the planet know nothing about. A boring list of names coupled with the fact that according to a study done by Microsoft, my attention span is no shorter than a goldfish, would mean that a book that started like that would most likely stay on the shelf. So why would Matthew open his book with a genealogy? You see, ancient writers didn't just view someone's family tree like a chronological list that we might find on Ancestry.ca. Rather, besides being crucial legal documents that could establish one's claim to, to be king or nobility, um, ancients believed that we could deduce things about our own character by looking at what was known about the character of our ancestors. 
these genealogies, instead of being a tedious list of, list, of, list of names, tracing back generations, evoked memories and stories attached to people who could have long been forgotten. So these genealogies became like a literary DNA, reminders of stories that had the ability to define and reveal the character and destiny of a person. In Matthew's case, this happened to be Jesus. See, Matthew's epiphany about Jesus regarding his identity, who he is and what he is about, is rooted in his ancestry. So this morning, we're going to take a look at the genealogy of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17, and try to answer these two questions. How does the gene pool of Jesus reveal who he is? And the second is this, what are the implications for us as his body? in terms of the shaping of our character and priorities as the people of God. This is the reason I've entitled this sermon, It's in Our Genes. So let's jump in here. Now, I'm not going to read you the genealogy this morning, but I would encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 1 in your Bibles, or you can find it on your device. Um, I'll also put the, uh, the relevant verses up here on the screens behind you um, for you if you aren't able to access the scripture. But like I said, Uh, Earlier, ancient authors used genealogies to evoke memories and stories. So what's the story found in the genes of Jesus? What is the story that Matthew is telling, and how does it reveal who Jesus is? Well, Matthew actually helps us out with the answer to that question, by how he constructed Jesus' family tree. So we're going to take a look at five realities that Matthew reveals about Jesus, and then talk about some of the implications these realities may have on our lives. So Genesis, or, uh, sorry, Ma- Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, uh, starts off like this. The book of the genealogy of Jesus, the son of David, the son of God, or son of Abraham, sorry. Obviously he's the son of God. All right, so Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Um, what Matthew is trying to get us uh, to, to see here is that Jesus is the real beginning. You see, how, I, how we know that is that the word that we translate uh, toldot in the uh, translate genealogy, sorry, is actually the word toldot. All right, it's a Hebrew word, toldot, which means the generations of. It's the same word that the author of Genesis uses in Genesis chapter 2 when he introduces the generations of the heavens and the earth. Or in Genesis chapter 5 when the author introduces the generations of Adam. You see, Matthew wants to take us back here to the beginning. He wants us to see that Jesus is at the beginning. He is, in fact, the real beginning. Now, a lot of times when a biblical author wants you to think of something old, it's because he wants to introduce to you something new. They're a little sneaky like that. So here is the twist. Like I've already said, Matthew wants us to connect the genealogy of Jesus to the genealogies in Genesis that recount the descendants of Adam Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The interesting thing with Matthew's genealogy is that he doesn't list the descendants of Jesus, but rather goes backwards, and he lists his ancestors. This is significant because whatever whatever story that Matthew is trying to tell here, he has now set Jesus as its focal point, as the climax. You see, Matthew is trying to tell us that from the beginning of time, All of history has been pointing to this this moment. Everything that has come before Jesus now makes sense or finds its meaning in Jesus. We find echoes of this when the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 17. He says this, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. What Paul is getting at here is the same thing that Matthew wants us to see. Jesus was there at the beginning. He created all things, and it is through him that all of creation finds meaning. Matthew wants us to see that Jesus is the real beginning. Well, if we keep going on through the, through the genealogy, we come to verse 2, which starts off like this. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time unpacking Abraham because Pastor Lucas has already 
done this in a great series of sermons that we just came out of called Thread. So I'm going to do my little commercial now. All right, so you can actually access those sermons on uh, www.bayviewglen.org and uh, just click on the Thread series and you can find all that uh, there is to know about Abraham, the father of Isaac. But I, I want to say this as a refresher. You see, Abraham was regarded by the Jews as the ideal Jew. The apostles Paul and James would go on to write that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. James even goes further and says that he was called God's friend. Abraham is set up as a character in the biblical story as one who stayed the course and whose faith, although tested, never wavered until his death. He was the example of who Israel was supposed to be, a nation, a people that were blessed to be a blessing. In essence, Abraham was the real Israel. This is important to remember because it is through Abraham that all the nations of the world would be blessed, as we see in Genesis 12, 3. So Matthew wants us to know that it is now through Jesus that all of God's promises for Israel and ultimately the world are fulfilled. A promise he would fulfill in his death, providing forgiveness for the sins of the world, but also through the creation of a new people, a new Israel. A people called by the name of Jesus, who, would, who he would send out to be a source of blessing in the world. Matthew, Matthew wants us to see that Jesus has now become what Israel was supposed to be. Jesus is the real Israel. Well, if we keep on moving through the genealogy, we come to verse 6. And verse 6 says this, And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. We come across this very important character in the genealogy of Jesus, King David. And like I've already said with Abraham, Pastor Lucas actually unpacked um, who King David is and the significance of, of him to the story of Jesus uh, in the Thread series. But what we need to remember about King David is, like Abraham, um, is the promise that God made to him. You see, God promised David that there would be a king from his line that would last forever. This descendant of David would be Israel's forever king. And so Matthew wants us to make sure that we catch the point that Jesus is not just an ordinary descendant of David, but he comes as Israel's real king, the forever king, the one um, at whom's feet all the nations would ultimately come and bow. Jesus is the real king. Well, as we continue on and we come to verse 11 and 12, which is the next section in Matthew's genealogy, we are reminded of a dark moment in the history of Israel. We're reminded of the exile with these words, after the deportation to Babylon. You see, we know that at some point in Israel's history, they had rejected God and they had turned to their own way and they had refused to become the people that God had created them to be. And so God punished them for their sin by sending them into, into exile. And, uh, and like I said, we come across, uh, when we come to this part of Jesus' genealogy, we are reminded about the deportation of Babylon. But here's the thing. Even though, we, I mean, we know that God brought his people out of Babylon. He brought them back to the land of Israel. He brought them back so they could rebuild their wall, so they could rebuild their temple, so they could start to be the people that God had created them to be. But the interesting thing about this is that the people of Israel never, uh, never believed that they had truly come home. They had never believed that the exile was still, or the exile was over. In fact, if you look at Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 36, Nehemiah writes this, here we are. Slaves to this day, slaves in the land that you gave to our ancestors to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. You see, the Jews still felt like prisoners in their own land. They had left Babylon, the empire, but the empire still had a hold on them. They were not a free people able to make their own decisions. They were still subject to the law of, in Nehemiah's day, the Persians. And in Matthew's day, the violence and brutality of the Romans. They still needed to be delivered from the hands of an oppressive empire. They needed the Messiah to come. The hope of all Israel was that when their Messiah showed up, he would restore the fortunes of his people. That the weight of the oppressor would be lifted and the kingdom of Israel would be unveiled in all its glory, ruling the nations forever. 
This ancient hope is echoed in the songs we sing at Christmas. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. See, Matthew calls Jesus the Messiah. Verse 16 says, Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. But he wasn't quite the Messiah that they were expecting. Jesus didn't drive out one Roman soldier out of Jerusalem, but he did drive cheats out of the temple. He didn't lead one rebellion or commit acts of violence. In fact, when his followers chopped off the ear of someone coming to arrest Jesus, he reached out and healed him. When questioned by Roman authorities, he wasn't defiant, but was quiet and willingly suffered suffered the punishment for crimes he didn't commit. You see, the kingdom he inaugurated wasn't a political kingdom that would be quantified by borders and boundaries. And yet it threatened to overturn the existing empires of the day. It wasn't just a spiritual kingdom that promised followers heaven when they died. It was a tangible kingdom. One that had life-altering implications for those who understood it. You see, the kingdom Jesus brought was birthed in the hearts of those who would follow after him. And every blind man that saw, every cripple that walked, every dead person raised to life, every demon cast out was evidence that there was a new kingdom among them. That Jesus, the Messiah, the real Messiah, had come. You see, Jesus wasn't concerned with the restoration of a nation like his contemporaries. His mission was about the restoration of humanity. He was about restoring the image of God and those he had created. It was through his restorative work and people that he would ensure his kingdom would know no boundary and that his kingdom would have no end. Matthew wants us to understand that Jesus is the real Messiah. Well, I said we were going to go through five realities of Jesus, and so we've come to the fifth reality that Matthew wants to communicate to us. And Matthew wants to communicate this last reality, which is this, that Jesus is the real Jubilee. All right, now I'm throwing that out there, and I see a bunch of confused looks on your face, and I get it, because we don't understand what we, what we mean by this real Jubilee. I want, to read a, I want to read verse 17 for you in Matthew's genealogy. It sums it up. It's like the conclusion of it, and it says this. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the, to the Christ, 14 generations. In order to understand what Matthew is trying to reveal in this final reality of Jesus, we have to do this. We have to look at the numbers. Now, most scholars agree that this is not a complete list of the ancestors of Jesus. So why did Matthew choose the number 14? All right, so here's here's where I need some help. Uh, Is there anybody in the audience that is under 14? I can't see up and the lights are blinding me up there. I'm I'm hoping there's going to be, okay, I see some hands over here. Okay, great. So here's the deal. I got a word problem for you. I am not a math whiz. I can just let you know that. Uh, That's why I became a pastor. I did not have to do math. And so um, uh, there's, there's more to it than that. But, I mean, that, that kind of sums it up. Um, so uh, so here, here's my word problem. And uh, I just want you to shout out the answer. All right? Shout out the answer when you, uh, when, you, when you got it. So what two numbers are equal to each other, but when added together, equal 14? Well, you guys aren't 14, all right? You guys got it back there? Seven. seven? Okay, perfect. Seven. Yes, seven. Now, the number seven was extremely significant in Jewish writing. And if you were a Jew in the time of Jesus and you were reading through his genealogy and saw the number 14, you would immediately be looking for something significant in the text. You see, in Jewish culture, every seven years they had a sa- or every seven days, sorry, they had a Sabbath. Every seven years there was a sabbatical year, and every seven times seven years or forty-nine years, they were supposed to have, according to the Book of Leviticus, a jubilee. During the jubilee, if you were a slave, you got to go free. If you had sold off some of your family land, well, it got returned to you. If you were in debt. Those debts were forgiven. I mean, can you imagine 
if we practice Jubilee in Canada? I mean, just think about that. All right? I mean, talk about leveling the playing field. It would mean a total end to generational poverty. I mean, it, it, would, it would basically wipe it right out. Um, wealth would continually be redistributed amongst people. Um, it, it wouldn't be, we wouldn't be held hostage by debt or by the mortgage or a mortgage or the bank. Um, the balance of power would be totally reshuffled. I mean, it would be crazy. And maybe that is why, as far as we know, the year of Jubilee was never celebrated in Israel. It was in their law, but it was never celebrated. So let's get back to the numbers. So Matthew uses the number 14 three times to describe the generations up to Jesus. And if we take those 14 and break them down, we get uh, in, into its sevens, we get six sevens. All right? Matthew sets Jesus up as the seventh seven. He is the Jubilee in person. He is the one who is going to rescue Israel, like I've said previously, from her exile. He, says the angel to Joseph, is the one who will save his people from their sins. Now, to a first century Jew, this didn't didn't just mean uh, personal forgiveness. Lamentations 4.22 says this, The punishment for your iniquity, O daughter Zion, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer. You see, Israel's punishment for sin was exile. So if sins are now forgiven, it means the exile is over. The time has come for fortunes to be restored and for things to be put back as they should be. Matthew wants us to see that Jesus is this jubilee. He is the real jubilee, the one in whom things are restored, the one in whom things are put back to rights. You see, the gospel writer saw the events concerning Jesus, particularly his kingdom inaugurating life, death, and resurrection, not just as isolated events to which remote prophets might have distantly pointed. They saw those events as bringing the long story of Israel to its proper goal. You see, Matthew wanted to reveal the realities of Jesus being the real beginning the real Israel, the real king, the real Messiah, and the real Jubilee, because he was trying to tell us that Jesus is the climax of Israel's story. In fact, I think we could safely say that Jesus is the climax of the biblical story. All of history, before Jesus, and all that would come after him to our present, and even into the future, finds its meaning, restoration, and fulfillment in him. His story is the story that we find ourselves in. So what are some of the implications that we have for our, for our lives? Well, the first one is this. You see, our stories of brokenness find restoration in his story. Our stories of brokenness find restoration in his story. You know, it's, it's easy for us to have these stories of brokenness become the defining stories of our lives. Our stories of broken marriages, struggling with the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, life choices that have led us down a road of self-destruction, the story of perfectionism that has left you not feeling good enough, a story of lost identity where you find yourself floundering without a sense of purpose or direction. But I'm here to tell you that these stories don't have to define us. These stories don't have to define us. You see, when I think about the social experiment that the year of Jubilees could have been, it reveals to me a God who understands us totally. It reveals a God who understands that that the consequences for our unwise choices are sometimes too much to bear. A God who understands that sometimes we get sideswiped by life. A God who understands that all of us could use a mulligan every now and then, a do-over at some point in our lives. And this is what we find in the Jubilee. We find this in Jesus as the real Jubilee in person. You know, he wants to give you your life back. This is what God is about in our world. He is on a mission of restoration. He is stepping into our brokenness and he brings with him his healing and his hope. Which brings me to the next implication our life's mission becomes reoriented by his story. 
our life's mission becomes reoriented by his story. You see, if the story of Jesus is about restoration, if this is the mission that he is on, then how does this mission get accomplished? I gotta tell you, it's through us. The mandate of the Messiah is now the mission of his people. His story calls us to reorient our lives around his mission. It's a story that calls us out of our culture of individualism and into a culture of community and togetherness and oneness. Like Abraham, we are a people who have been blessed and now we're sent into the world to bring the blessing of the healing and hope of Jesus to a world that needs to be restored. Reorienting our life's mission around the story of Jesus means a turning away from ourselves and a turning towards others, stepping into their lives so that we share our lives and stories with them. Well, how, how can we do this? The story of Jesus calls us out, like I said, of our culture of individualism. It's easy for us to get comfortable with our own rhythms and routines and not be aware of what is going on all around us. And so, since we're in the new year, sometimes we got to shake up those rhythms and shake up those routines in order to orient our lives towards others. So I just want to give you four very simple uh, suggestions this morning. These are not rocket science, but these are things that would maybe if, uh, help you shake your routines and help you reorient your life uh, around the mission of Jesus. The first one is this, to think, to think, who in your life, who is in your life that could, that could who is in your life that you could take a step towards in order to bring the healing and hope of Jesus? Who is that person? Think about them. Make the phone call. Send the text. Start the conversation. Pray for them. Think about them. Who is in your life that could use um, the healing and hope of Jesus? The second one, and I'm going to ruthlessly uh, take advantage of this moment, is to join a life group. All right? <laughs> join a life group. Um, our life groups are about life on mission together. Uh, they are great opportunities for you to share your life with others and to bring the life of Jesus to the neighborhoods that those life groups find themselves in. It's a great opportunity for you to meet with people, all right? for you to connect with people, to shake up your routines, to carve out uh, time during the week to actually meet with somebody who you can share life with. I can tell you for these first initial ones, it's only an eight-week commitment. It's only eight weeks. Eight weeks that may, just enough time to start a new routine and a new rhythm, one that would reorient your life around the mission of Jesus. Well, the third way is that you could actually get involved with the organizations that we help support over Christmas. We supported three families, and thank you so much for your generosity. The offering that we received on, uh, on Christmas Eve far exceeded our expectations and our goals. So I just want to say thank you for your generosity. But it was this. I mean, we help three organizations that are about uh, bringing uh, the restorative work of Jesus to the people in the GTA. We help safe families. We help Toronto City Mission, and we helped our refugee sponsorship group. I mean, those are three organizations that you could shake up your routine with, that you could actually reach out and get involved and help them do the work that they're doing um, for Jesus in the GTA. And then the last thing, the last way that you can kind of shake your routines to reorient your life towards others is this. Just serve here at the church. We have so many different areas for you to get involved with. I mean, I can tell you one area in which we need people right now is in our area of our guest services. We need people who are going to be part of our connect team, who are going to be those friendly faces that are out in the foyer that are shaking hands and saying, you know what, we're so glad you're here. How can we connect you to others? We need people for that. We also need people to be that warm smile and a, and a firm handshake at our doors when people walk in to say, hey, welcome to Bayview, Bayview Glen. We are so glad that you're here among us. There are so many ways that you can get involved um, here at the church. And uh, like I said, another opportunity for you to shake those routines, to orient yourself towards others, to be a part of the restorative work that Jesus is doing in the world. I mean, four simple things. Four simple things that are a start to kind of reorienting ourselves towards others. Like I said, these are just some simple steps to help reorient our life's mission around the restorative mission of Jesus. 
We're going to uh, move into a time of communion, so I'm just going to invite the ushers to get, uh, to get ready for that. But as we celebrate communion this morning, I actually can't think of a better conclusion to my sermon than this. Because what we are reminded of when we partake of the bread, when we, when we take of the cup, we're reminded that in Jesus, in the brokenness of Jesus, we find healing, we find hope, we find restoration. In the cup, we find his forgiveness. But here's the other thing that we find too. And Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. What we find is that that little piece of uh, cracker that we hold in our hands reminds us that we are attached to a much bigger body. That we are not individuals that show up to Bayview Glen Church. That we are a family. That we are one. We are a community. A community that God has called to be a blessing to the world. A community that God has given a mission to that we need to reorient our lives around so that we live out the restorative work of Jesus in the lives of the people that we come into contact with. Let's, as the ushers come forward, let's, uh, let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for uh, the fact that we are reminded monthly of your work in our lives, your restorative work in our world. God, I thank you so much for the bread and for the cup and for what they symbolize to us. And Father, I pray that these symbols won't be lost on us as we partake of them, but they would be ones who remind us what, who you are and who we are as well. And so God, as we take, prepare to take this time to examine ourselves, to reflect, to kind of sit at your feet, Jesus, we just ask that you would reveal yourself to us. And we pray these things in your name.